Now we have our last keynote um, speaker of, uh, of the event, and then I'm just going to say a, a few words of goodbye after that, and then we can all go and um, have a drink in the Ashmolean. Um, now, you may have, you may have thought, um, many of you probably by now know that uh, Victor Meyer Schoenberger is um, joining Bill Dutton and myself as the, uh, one of the three professors of the Oxford Internet Institute. So you may have thought that we were kind of economizing on the last keynote speaker by <laughs> inviting somebody from the office opposite, but that's absolutely not the case. We did not know that <laughs> when we invited Victor, and nor did he know that when he accepted. So um, I just wanted to make that clear. Um, so. Victor is very unusual in that he is um, an academic lawyer with several um, law degrees, one of them from Harvard, but also um, a te technologist, um, having founded uh, a software company as long ago as 1986. Um, he's joining us in Ox... Sorry? Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> I'm still older than you. Um, uh, he, he joins us from Singapore, where he was the Associate Professor of the Lee Kuan... U School of Public Policy and Director of the Information and Innovation Policy Research Center. Before that, um, he was the, at the Kennedy School at Harvard for 10 years. Um, he's, he's published seven books, one of which um, was published last year to great acclaim and several prizes, um, which is Delete the Virtue of Forgetting in the Digital Age, which he's going to talk about now. Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much, Helen, uh, yeah, for having me. Um, and in particular for uh, not disinviting me after you heard that I would join the OII. Um, so when I asked Helen what I should talk about at uh, the end of this conference, I was envisioning that she'd say, you know, talk about some empirical stuff that you did, show some nice graph, uh, do some regression tables and so forth. And I was looking forward to sort of a deep discussion. And instead, she said, talk about forgetting. All your fault, Helen. I'll talk about forgetting. But this is not going to be a typical or any academic presentation. I want you, because I am the only thing between this and drinks, <laughs> and that is the worst position you can be in, um, I want you to kind of sit back for a moment, uh, relax a little bit, but not too much to fall asleep, and to indulge, if you want, with me in a meditation of sorts on forgetting. Stacy Snyder wanted to be a teacher. By spring of 2006, she had completed her coursework and was looking forward to her teacher's certificate. Then, from one day to the next, her dream was over. She was summoned to the dean of her university and told that she would not receive her certificate. She would not be a teacher, although she had the credits, passed the exams, completed practical training. Many with high honors. She would not be given her certificate, she was told, because her behavior was not becoming of a teacher. Her behavior, a photo, showing her with a cap and a cup, captioned drunken pirate. Stacy Snyder had put this photo on her MySpace webpage for her friends to see and perhaps to chuckle. But the university administration found the photo to induce minors to consume alcohol, and thus to be inappropriate for a teacher. When Stacy was confronted by the university administration, she considered taking the photo offline. But it was too late. Her photo had been indexed by search engines and archived by web crawlers. As much as Stacy wanted the photo to be forgotten, the internet would not permit that. Remembering instead of forgetting. Remembering, forgetting. 
In 2001, Andrew Feldmar, a Canadian psychotherapist living in Vancouver, wrote an academic article for a journal. In the article, he mentioned that he had taken LSD in the 60s. In the summer of 2006, like many times before, Andrew Feldmar wanted to cross into the United States to pick up a friend from Seattle Tacoma International Airport. The immigration officer, the US immigration officer, Googled Feldmar and discovered the academic article from 2001. Because Feldmar had failed to disclose to the immigration officer, although he never denied it, that he had taken drugs 40 years earlier. He was fingerprinted, investigated, and then barred from entering into the United States forever. Remembering instead of forgetting. Of course, you may say now, Stacy's and Andrew's cases are tragic, but at least in part, it's their own fault. Had they not put information online, Stacy would be a teacher now, and Andrew could still travel into the United States. Everybody has to decide for her and himself what to make available online. Or to paraphrase Richard Dürn, Friedrich Dürnmatt, what once has been put on the web is no longer forgotten. Really? Do we really know every time information about us is being collected, stored, and made accessible? For most of us, Google is the search engine of choice. Millions of people around the world send more than two billion search queries to Google every day. Google is showing them, is showing us the way. Google also shows us what is being searched when, where, and by whom, as I'm sure you have looked at Google Trends. Google is so good in predicting what we look for that we can actually also predict what we are interested in. And I'm sure you have seen the Google flu trends mapping almost perfectly the US flu activity in last year. Google can do this even for events years back because Google does not forget. Since Google's humble beginnings more than 10 years ago, Google has stored every single search query it ever received. Two billion a day. Every single search query it ever received. And every search result you and everybody else ever clicked on. Through cleverly combining information streams, Google believes it can link queries to individuals. Google thus knew for many years what each one of us has searched for and when and on what search results we clicked. Quite literally, therefore, Google knew more about you than you can remember yourself. Remembering, forgetting. For millennia, for us humans, forgetting's been easy. It's built into us. Biologically, we forget most of what we experience every day, our feelings, our thoughts. Remembering is hard. Since the beginning of time, we humans have tried to overcome biological forgetting and to hold on to memories that are precious. For thousands of years, we have tried, like this Navajo, to pass on our memories to our children in the hope that they, too, may thus be able to remember. This is how the great epics of the world emerged thousands of years ago. But human memory is not fixed. It changes as we reconstruct our past. Depending on it may not be sufficient, especially when we want to capture something precisely or for a long period of time. Painting is one way of encapsulating visual impressions to create an external, more precise and lasting memory like this beautiful cave drawing from Altamira. Script, 
originally developed Will You Believe It by accountants searching for a precise method of remembering has for millennia remained humanity's preferred external memory. Language, painting, script provided us with the capacity to remember through generations and across time. But these tools have not altered the fundamental fact that for us humans, forgetting is easy and remembering is hard, time-consuming, costly. The book did not change that either. Neither did the phonograph or film. Remembering remained expensive for most human beings and was thus chosen carefully. In other words, forgetting was the default, remembering the exception. This enabled us to deal with time. Through our physiological capacity to forget, we rid ourselves of excess memory. Thus, we pay tribute to time and depreciate what is no longer relevant to our present. But because forgetting is biological. We humans never had to develop the cognitive capability to deliberately forget. Even though it might be possible to do so and to depreciate memories and to make them fade. Today this is different. Google remembers, Yahoo remembers, Amazon remembers, the Internet Archive remembers, flight reservation systems remember. Flight reservation systems remember? Yes, they do. If you make a flight reservation but never book the flight, they remember for six months, just in case. And not always do we realize that we have contributed to digital memory and made it accessible on the net. Consider this example. This is a wonderful map of the city of London. The color, the color dots signify where people took photographs and then uploaded their photographs to Flickr. And what you see is that the density, that uh, the, the lighter the color, the redder the color, the more people took photographs. So you can see what are the sightseeing hotspots in the city of London. That is tracking people geographically, but you can also track people geographically and over time if they upload their photographs on Flickr and do that repeatedly, you just go to the EXIF data and have fun. Remembering. From biological forgetting, we have moved to comprehensive remembering. How did this happen? You know that as much as I do. I can be brief. First, four elements. First, digitization. Second, advances in storage technology. In 1965, a young engineer by the name of Gordon Moore surmised that the density of integrated circuits, quote, might approximate a doubling every two years, unquote. Importantly, digital storage capacity, as you see here, has tracked this impressive increase in processing power that Gordon Moore first witnessed more than four decades ago. But storage alone is not sufficient. The East German Stasi had hundreds of millions of facts in its files on over a million people. And yet, with its elaborate systems of pseudonyms and codes and mostly paper-based files, it had difficulty in the end of retrieving the information it had in time. This too is different today as full text indexing, prohibitively expensive only a few decades ago, is so affordable that it's not only what drives user expectation on the internet, Google, Bing, but also is built into most major file systems. Add to this the ability to access information through a global infrastructure. A few minutes of a document being online are sufficient to disseminate it, even accidentally, and have it distributed around the globe. As this page from the Manual of Operating Air Force One, which was made available online accidentally for a couple of minutes. Once the mistake was realized, it was too late. And this, by the way, is how you get into Air Force One, just in case you ever need it. Taken together today, this has led to remembering becoming the default and forgetting 
the exception. To an extent, this ought to be reason for celebration. Yes, our vast and accessible digital memories offer numerous benefits, from increased accuracy, improved efficiency, all the way to the promise to help us transcend human mortality. The same token, undoing forgetting has, I believe, consequences far beyond the narrow confines of information efficiencies. Two terms characterize what I believe is at stake, power and time. Power is relative and relational. As information privacy scholars have long argued, power over information may translate into power over the individual the information pertains to. But such informational power reaches far beyond the confines of information privacy. For centuries, the Catholic Church rested its power in no small part on its domination of the institutions of remembering, from scribes and books to libraries. A societal consequence of such power imbalance has often been for people on the receiving end to choose silence. This is precisely what power holders intend. And that has, to get together, taken the potential to influence how we transact and we interact. Take Jeremy Bentham's panopticum. The concept of a prison in which the prison guards can watch the prisoners without the prisoners knowing when they're actually being watched. The aim of the panopticum is behavioral compliance through the permanent threat of invisible surveillance. Oscar Gandhi and others have suggested the internet may help create a global panopticum in which everybody has to assume that she is being watched all the time. Such a panopticum may lead people to self-censor, fearing that their utterances could be misconstrued by any of the hundreds of millions of individuals and thousands of jurisdictions connected to it. But today, we face, I believe, more than just a global panopticon. Because of the comprehensive digital memory, we have to assume that what we say or do on the net will not only be witnessed today, but will remain accessible for years, perhaps decades, into our future. This creates what I call a temporal panopticum in which we may self-censor because we are not because we are afraid of how people might interpret our words and deeds today, but because we are afraid of how people and institutions and the distant future might view them. My second concern is time or more precisely, how we humans deal with time. As I mentioned, forgetting is biological. So we humans did not have to develop a conscious mechanism to put different, perhaps contradictory events and therefore pieces of memory in a temporal perspective. Consider the following hypothetical. It's a um, it's a weakness of lawyers to think in hypotheticals. So consider the following hypothetical, Jane and John. Jane and John are old friends. Although they live in different cities, they try to catch up at least once a year. One day, Jane receives an email from her friend John telling her he's coming to town and looks forward to having coffee. Jane's excited. She hasn't seen her old friend John in almost a year, and wants to reply right away, suggesting a place to meet. To remind her where they met last time John was seeing her, she queries her mailbox folder. Up pop dozens of emails she had received from John over the years. She's quickly browsing through them to find the right one, but then her eye catches a 10-year-old email with a strange subject line. She starts to scan its text, then she begins to read. 
surprised, perhaps even shocked, she reads about how John deceived her. And she revisits an angry exchange back and forth between them. Slowly, the events and her feelings triggered by this concrete external stimulus come back to her mind, her sense of betrayal and deception. She reads on about how over the following months and years, John and herself must have reconciled, although exactly how and why, the emails do not tell. But at the forefront of her mind is now how John, her dear friend John, deceived her. And suddenly, she is not so sure anymore. She wants to meet John when he comes to town. As much as her analytic mind wants to disregard the revived memory, the angry words she read triggered her recollection. They are the external memory that help us remember things we thought we forgot. But they also, as this example show, may cloud our ability to evaluate and to decide. Put in more abstract terms, as cognitive psychologists remind us, for us humans, it is difficult to realize time as a dimension of change. In analog times, that dangers were limited. Our biological forgetting obscured our cognitive difficulties with time. But what when we are not permitted to forget anymore? We know a little bit about the consequences through studies of less than a handful of human beings who have biological difficulties to forget. This is AJ, a woman who has difficulties forgetting. Ask her about a particular day. She's able to tell you when she woke up, who called, what was running on television for every day 30 years ago. AJ cannot forget. But for her, it is not a blessing. It's a curse. She is haunted by her past so much, in fact, that she says it limits her ability to decide in the present. As Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges said, perfect memory pushes humans to get lost in detail with no ability to generalize, to abstract, and to evolve. They lose, Borges writes, what makes us truly human. Tethered to an ever more detailed past rather than living and acting in the present. This is the fate we may face with comprehensive digital memory. Through perfect digital memory, we also deny each other the capacity to change over time, to evolve and to grow. Without forgetting, it is hard for us to forgive. And so, with comprehensive digital remembering, we may turn into an unforgiving society. But there is another wrinkle to the story. What if, what if frustrated with the shortcomings of our own human memory, we begin to disregard our own recollection of our past and depend and believe digital memory instead? Does that give those that control digital memory, Flickr, YouTube, Google, the power to change history? These are some of the threats of shifting the default from forgetting to remembering. So if you followed me so far, I'm about 80% done. So what should we do? Well, some responses already exist. The first one, the most obvious one, of course, is to enact information privacy rights. The idea of information privacy rights is intriguingly simple. By giving each and every individual a right to informational privacy, we empower the people to fight for their rights. Enforcement, therefore, is both decentralized and delegated. Sounds great. 
but it comes with a number of inherent weaknesses. Most importantly, that those that we aim to empower, citizens like us, do not care. In Europe, for example, strong information privacy rights have been enacted decades ago, but by and large, people have not used them, or at least not used them in courts. Information ecology, the second approach, is the conscious regulatory restriction of what personal information can be stored and for how long. Such information ecology norms necessitate government action and compliance enforcement may be costly. But they have two advantages over individual privacy rights. First, they do not require individuals to go to court for enforcement. And second, they protect against an uncertain future. Protect against an uncertain future Consider the case of the Dutch Citizen Register, put in place in the 1930s for a perfectly good reason to ensure administration of social security, the register included information on religion and ethnicity. The Nazis, when they invaded the Netherlands, raided the, uh, the register and repurposed the information in it and so we're able to murder, proportionally speaking, more Dutch Jews than those from France, Poland, or Germany. Even Jewish refugees in the Netherlands fared better because they were not included in the register. It is a horrific lesson, as we cannot foresee the future, and thus how personal information about us will be used <laughs> It may be better to store less than more. This is the essence of information ecology. Unfortunately, since September the 11th, 2001, we have seen a significant backlash here, together with a wave of information retention laws uh, as part of a rhetoric of fear and security, and thus limiting the political chances for a much needed expansion of information ecology norms to address digital remembering. Perhaps, therefore, we need to think beyond laws. Some have argued for digital abstinence, for staying away from the technical tools that enable digital remembering. Not sharing everything on Facebook, President Obama reminded us, may certainly reduce the threat of digital remembering. But is it realistic with over 600 million registered users worldwide? And would we want to deprive us of the value of information sharing and peer production that the tools of Web 2.0 provide us with? Another option, ostensibly the exact opposite of digital abstinence, is the idea of full contextualization, or to store digitally as much information as possible. Sounds weird, but here's the argument. Perhaps the problem with digital memory is that it does not capture enough, enough of an event, for example, to let us relive it accurately enough later on. If we only could store everything, including the context of an event, we could avoid the negative side effects of digital memory. In essence, full contextualization helps us would help us to regain our ability to think in time. At the same time, it would also equalize information imbalances. So at its core, this is Brin's proposal of a transparent society. But will full contextualization ever be technically feasible? And even if it were, do we really have time to relive all of our past events and experiences again and again and again, only to grasp what experiences are no longer relevant for us? A further alternative is to hope for a cognitive adjustment in our society. That is the hope 
that over time we learn to devalue older information and to live in a world with an omnipresent past. Not society has to change or its laws, but our individual processing of information, its evaluation and decision making. That sounds right. And that would solve our problem. I like cognitive adjustment. But my cognitive psychologist friends tell me that it won't work. They are quite skeptical of our human ability to force ourselves into a change in how we evaluate and process distant memories that we suddenly recall through an external stimulus of digital storage. They suggest that it may take us human a very long time to rewire our brains and to change the way we assess information, to modify what we have been doing for ages. And also, even if we could, what would be the appropriate mechanism to effectuate such change? A different idea is not to change humans, but to change technology. Some have proposed to use technology to change the behavior. We could create, they suggested, quasi-property rights to personal information, somewhat like copyright, and build into our technology, our PCs, smartphones, etc., the technology to ensure that only those can process and use my personal information to who I have permitted to. In short, the suggestion is to create the global digital rights management system to protect privacy. But wait a moment. Do we really need to create a global technology infrastructure that needs to watch every hour move to ensure that nobody abuses somebody else's personal information? Would we not thereby create a perfect surveillance system to ensure privacy? I presented six possible approaches to deal with the challenges posed by digital remembering. Privacy rights and information ecology employ legal norms to address the challenge. Digital abstinence and cognitive adjustment hope this could be achieved on an individual level, while privacy, DRM, and full contextualization mainly rest on achieving technical breakthroughs. The three on the left mainly target what I call the power aspect of digital remembering. The three on the right mainly address the time challenge. None of these offer us a silver bullet, although all of them help in their very unique way. Hence, we may need to mix and to combine them and uh, perhaps to even add something else. Something else? You've done 95%. Something else. In addition to a combination of the tools that I've already uh, outlined, I advocate for a revival of forgetting. That is to establish mechanisms that ease forgetting in the digital age and that make remembering just a bit more strenuous. Not by much. I don't want to overly burden remembering but just enough to ship the, ship, shift sorry, the incentives of forgetting and remembering back to where we humans are used to. One version of this could be called expiration dates for information. I would imply that whenever we want to store information, we are prompted to enter not just the name or the location of storage, but also a date until which we want the information to be stored. Once the date is reached, the information is deleted. Of course, we could choose an expiry date at will and change that date at any time. A beauty of expiration date is that it enables us to, to have um, tools of in uh, instant information sharing, use them, continue to use them, and thus create the digital equivalence of oral communication cultures 
these tools seem to mimic but never really get there. Please understand, the core of this proposal is not the automatic deletion of information or the technical infrastructure to ensure compliance. The core of the proposal is that prompting for expiration dates will remind us humans again and again that most information is not timeless but linked to a specific context and situation, that it loses its value as time passes. Expiration dates, I believe, offer us a meaningful way of linking digital memory with time and thereby implement a temporal dimension into digital memory. Make no mistake, while helpful as an illustration, expiration dates also come with a bag of weaknesses of their own. They're no silver bullet. They're not designed to solve the information privacy challenges beyond digital remembering. Perhaps most troubling expiration dates are still very binary, while human forgetting is much more gradual. Perhaps, therefore, eventually we can develop systems of digital forgetting that are more gradual as well and permit a kind of digital rusting. <laughs> the time challenge I outlined earlier, but not the power challenge, I'm afraid, could be addressed, at least to an extent, by ensuring that older and perhaps less relevant information takes a bit longer to be retrieved so that we don't stumble over it like Jane did and thus risk clouding our decision making in the present. Remembering, remember putting, shoe, putting photos in a shoebox in the attic. You still have them up there and if you want to spend the time to go up in the attic all through the cobwebs, you can still find them. Although some of them may have faded over time. But retrieving these photos takes a little bit of effort and thereby makes forgetting the default and remembering the exception. That little bit of extra effort is, I believe, what helps us stay focused on the present. There are many variants of digital forgetting, but whatever version of expiration dates, for example, we come up with, I do foresee two common features. First, is we need to change the default from remembering back to forgetting. Forgetting can be slow or gradual or reconsidered, empowering the users to set it as they desire it, but it must be the default and remembering the exception. The second core feature is that digital forgetting offers us a meaningful mechanism to link temporal dimension with the information we commit to digital storage. In other words, to give us a choice and a chance to reflect and to choose. Forgetting, remembering. Since the beginning of time, forgetting's been easy for us and remembering's been hard. In the digital age, the relationship has become reversed. Today, digital remembering as the default, and it is forgetting that is often forgotten. I urge you, I urge you to give back to forgetting the role it deserves. Let us remember to forget. Thank you. My name is Jorge Salcedo from Autonoma University of Barcelona. Well, I like a lot your presentation, and I think that the idea, the, the, the main idea is very strong, but the question is about, well, who defines what we have to forget uh, and what information we have to forget it? Because I think that depends also in the context of the kind of information that we have or not have to forget it. And well, I want to listen about your opinion about this question. Sure. Sure. Thank you very much. It's an excellent question. Um, and I need to go back to, um, to here. 
uh, in order to uh, be remembered. <laughs> so um, the irony does not escape me. So the, um, the argument I have expanded at great length in the book because that's a very important question. So who is going to make the decision uh, about what to remember and what to forget? Now, it's actually somewhat easier than you might think. So when we store stuff on our hard disks, like Jane did, uh, that's a decision that she can take, um, as well as John. The situation is a little more complex when it's a dyadic relationship that produces the information. Let's say an e-commerce transaction. Uh, who is going to set an expiration date there? Uh, sh shall it be set by both parties um, or not? My sense is that different societies will differ in their implementation of a system of forgetting, uh, of digital forgetting or a system of expiration dates. So a more laissez-faire market-based driven society like the United States might opt for a very lightweight system in which market pressure pushes large information processes like Google or Amazon or so forth to adhere to expiration dates that its users set. Now, you might look at this and say, that's never going to work. Why should Amazon permit its customers to delete some transactional data that it can actually mine to provide book recommendations or purchasing recommendations more generally. The truth is Amazon is actually saddled with a big difficulty because they have all the transactional information of all the books, all the products that I bought 10 years ago, but they have no idea to know what of that information is still relevant to me today because my preferences, my values, my interests change. And so they would be tremendously happy to know what transaction information that they have in their digital storage is still relevant to me today or not. An expiration date that I could set gives them that opportunity. So for example, if I buy a study aid because I, I cram for an exam, I could set an expiration date uh, you know, a week after the exam or a couple of days after the exam. Hopefully I've passed it. Um, or if I buy a travel guide, uh, then I could set an expiration date for that particular transactional information um, for after I return from my holiday because once I've been there, I'm not going to buy another travel guide anytime soon, perhaps. Um, so there is an incentive for large information processors also to reach out to its customer base and to offer them an ability to forget or to set expiration dates. Other societies, uh, for example, more continental European societies more focused on information privacy regulation might opt for a legal framework uh, of expiration dates. In fact, um, the German Minister of the Interior and the Justice Minister both have announced, one in June, the other two weeks ago, that they will push for legislation or regulation to implement expiration dates for information on Facebook and other social networking sites. That is a regulatory approach. There is a, a full spectrum. You can go from market-based to regulatory um, uh, um, uh, enforcement and compliance mechanisms. And uh, you can think of uh, more heavy-handed or more lightweight uh, regulatory schemes. But I do believe that each and every society will have a chance to come up with its particular presets of values and come up with a system that might work. There's one back there. So 
Hi, uh, we are colleagues, although you don't know yet. I'm, I'm Sandra, I'm, I'm a research fellow at the Oxford Engineering Institute, and finally now we haven't had a chance to talk, but I've always been ta uh, taught that we should learn to forgive, not to forget. How does this fit in your, because it, it seems to me that in your first example, you know, it's not the future teacher's fault. I mean, it should be the institution for getting, right, or, right, you know, right, right. so, now, what do you think? That's a, uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I am a great fan of a um, Holocaust survivor by the name of Simon Wiesenthal. Uh, and Simon Wiesenthal wrote a wonderful book uh, called Forgiving, Not Forgetting. And that was what I believe this is all about, that we should forgive people for their trespasses, uh, for their misdeeds, uh, but we should also not forget it in the sense that we should learn uh, to, uh, to do better. And then I talked with my cognitive psychologist friends at length. And then they said to me, you know what? The way our brain works is that when we begin to forgive, that is when we begin to think some event in the past is no longer relevant for us because the person has changed or the circumstances have changed and so forth, we forget about that. So it turns out that forgiving and forgetting goes in parallel. And forgetting reinforces our capacity to forgive. Reminding ourselves continuously of somebody's misdeed in the past makes it incredibly hard for us to forgive that person, even though rationally we might want to. That's the problem that AJ is facing, the woman that has the biological difficulty of forgetting. She says, she published her autobiography now, but um, uh, which is quite interesting to read. Uh, National Geographic did a, a nice feature on her as well. But in the, um, in the research that was conducted on her, she said, I remember all of the bad mistakes I made in the past, all of the wrong decisions that I made in the past. And whenever I face a decision, all of the wrong decisions of the past come back. And I can't forgive myself, and because I can't forgive myself, because I remember, I remain indecisive. So that's the point. Hello, my name is Chaminder from Sri Lanka. Uh, I, I think this, the idea of looking from the other side is an exciting idea, and your presentation was excellent. But I think it's kind of, there's a sense of manipulation for me when I look at that, because I'm attracted to that. But now, my question is actually, when we should think about it, because now, for example, as you mentioned, uh, capacity to remember has its own advantage to different societies, to different countries. Right. And so you can utilize that for other work. Yes. For example, Google Maps, you can see all the places and do the work. Now, problems of six billion, out of six billion, six billion people right, in the world, maybe five billion people have not been able to capture the advantage of remembering. So. Yes when we should start unlearning or starting uh, remem uh, remembrance, because I think, we, for example, countries, uh, developing countries especially, uh, still we have to get advantage remembrance, maybe we can postpone uh, forgetting as a default. Yes, yes. Um, thank you very much. You point out something that I have not touched upon enough in my book, and certainly not in the presentation. Uh, and that is the, the digital divide dimension of dig, uh, digital remembering and digital forgetting. Um, people like Bryn have suggested that we could overcome the power challenge that I talked about by uh, making everything transparent so that not only the powerful information processors, the Googles of the world, have access to digital memory and digital storage, but also those that uh, whose information we store uh, have access to it. He calls it a reciprocal, a, reci a, a sort of a transparent reciprocity. And he hopes that, he, that we can overcome power imbalances, informational power imbalances doing that. And that may be true. Uh, and certainly we should move in that direction, uh, ensure that um, more of those that are being surveyed have access to the surveillance information. But then there is the time challenge, the time dimension that I talked about. And 
even perfect transparency does little to solve Jane's problem when she encounters the email of John that I described. Or AJ's problem of having a recollection of all of her failed decisions of the past. So I'm with you on working on overcoming the power imbalances because it solves some of the power challenge that I talked about. But I think it's not going to be sufficient because we still need to overcome the time challenge. Um, it seems that there may be a, a distinction that you might draw uh, relative to uh, one's structural position in a power relationship with regards to uh, remembering or forgetting. Because, you know, for instance, in terms of holding uh, political leaders accountable, that requires the act of memory. Um, and, and so, uh, I mean, I was curious what your reaction uh, you know, might be to that. Certainly, you know, we want protection uh, as private individuals in a certain sense. So we want that, that uh, protective forgetting, but uh, wouldn't we also want then uh, uh, protective remembering of, of certain people? Yes. Now, um, you're not entering this uh, completely uninterested because you're not only a political, sci you're a political scientist, you're not only a political scientist, you're also a researcher, and researchers, of course, want data. Uh, and, uh, and so that's a dimension, uh, an important dimension as well. I am not advocating for a ignorant society uh, that is not remembering at all anymore. In fact, all through the analog days, we remember. Uh, there's an argument that I don't make, but that has been made, that in the analog days, because remembering was slightly more expensive than forgetting, uh, people remembered what was valuable. And uh, while today we just by default capture everything, store everything, and that means there's such a huge sea of information out there uh, that is uh, even harder to uh, tackle and look at, uh, at uh, um, with uh, great detail. Now, I, am, I don't subscribe to that view, but the view that I subscribe to is let's try to shift the default back from remembering to forgetting, making forgetting just a little bit easier, remembering just a little bit harder, and at the same time, making remembering by making remembering the exception rather than the standard, the default, have a societal discussion about what we as a society want to remember and what we want to forget. The expiration date system, for example, makes it perfectly um, doable for you to set an expiration date 500 years into the future for your blog posts. If you think that your blog posts are so enormously valuable for future generations, or your sunsets, you know, whatever, the 15,000 sunsets on Flickr all look the same, if you think yours is particularly important and valuable, set you know, a, a long expiration date. If we as a society, a particular society, think this is important that we need to remember it, we should, we must. It's just the exception to the rule. You know, the, the um, legislative act in the United States uh, to remember what uh, the president uh, and his uh, advisors produce as a record makes perfect sense as the exception to the general rule. That's what it was up until very recently. It was the exception to the general rule. Most other things were forgotten. Uh, and so I think what we need to have is this societal debate about what is very important for us to remember and what is uh, okay to forget. Events in our history, in our societal collective history might be so important that we do want to remember it, that we want to create special institutions of remembering. Archives, museums. I'm all fine with that. I treasure that. I love museums. I love books. But I choose them because I want to remember them. It's my choice. And our society should have that choice too. But we might not give that choice to government, for example. 
Uh, well, de de depending on which, well, anyway, not go there. <laughs> because this is recorded and I might be held responsible for what I say later on. So, thanks very much for the very interesting presentation and the insights you provided regarding the surveillance society we literally live in. I just want to ask a very simple question. Uh, I agree with you with the expiration date that you say that we need to set something like that. But I thought that in some cases perhaps, this setting this expiration date may also mean that it is an act of remembering. Just imagine if you mm. have you mm. know, many mm. different sets of data yes. that you categorize them in a different way, setting different expiration dates. Yes. I th it comes to me, I'm not a psychologist, <laughs> that's yes. for sure, that people tend to think uh, about issues that they set a deadline somehow. Yes. So it may be a little time consuming or mental consuming activity. I agree with you, we should have the deliberate option to do that. Yes. But just wondering whether it is mm. another kind of remembering somehow. Yes. So thanks a lot. No, th that's very good. So let me tease this out for a second uh, in two ways. One is the question of whether the act of setting an expiration date itself is sort of uh, is uh, inscribing that event or that piece of information deeper in our uh, own um, memory or not. Um, and the second question is, suppose I had a little program that would remind me before things expire. Would that actually then also deepen uh, remembering, sort of be uh, exactly what I don't need or want? Well, the application would only be run by uh, those that are paranoid and to forget something. Um, and they are, they are remembering anyway. Um, but the first part is more interesting because this connects to recent research uh, and very interesting research on remembering and forgetting and how the brain works. It turns out that humans cannot only automatically forget, that it is a passive thing, that like, like a background process, a cron process that runs in the back. Um, humans also can actively forget. Um, something that's being explored as we speak with uh, functional MRIs, uh, works for words, works for videos so far. It's quite interesting. Um, a couple of, uh, of uh, folks in uh, Canada that have done groundbreaking work on this. Uh, but what it means is that if I set an expiration date and therefore have the expectation, a short expiration date, two weeks or so, and have therefore the expectation and made the decision that I want to forget this, I also am more likely to really forget it in my own cognitive, in my own human mind. Uh, and so it wouldn't do the the counter effect that you suggested. You're closing. Sun Tzu Wang, Yongnam University, uh, Korea. Uh, thank you, Victor. I feel a uh, lot better about myself now because I started forgetting things a lot this year <laughs> and I've uh, been complaining about it. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your anticipation about the uh, uh, expiration date asymmetry between different parties? I mean, b basically, I know that we are late in time, so let me try and encapsulate it very in, in, um, in a few sentences. So information asymmetry or information imbalance between large information processes and uh, digital storage sites like Google, for example, or Flickr, and, or Amazon, uh, and uh, consumers out there um, uh, are cause for concern. Now, how do we, if we had expiration dates, how do we overcome that? Because we still have that empower imbalance. So one way of overcoming that in a more regulated environment is to let the consumer have the last word. Uh, that's, that would be in line with consumer protection legislation that we see in continental Europe. Um, there is a lighter version of that saying, well, um, you need to, both sides need to be very transparent and have a, a, a negotiation uh, about expiration dates. Um, so let me give you a very quick example, if I may. Um, 
suppose you had expiration dates built into digital cameras. And if I would take a photo of you, you had on your key ring a little permission device uh, with perhaps three presets. I don't want to be photographed. I, wanna, I, I can be photographed, but you can only keep the photo for six months. And I can be photographed, and you can keep the photo for the next 500 years. OK, just assume this thought experiment. And I would take a photo of you, and my camera would automatically send out a request to all of your key rings and to ask to send the expiration date preset back. And then the lowest common denominator could be the expiration date for that photo that I made. Or if somebody of you sort of selected zero, I could say, please, you know, who is the zero in the crowd? You know, select a, a better expiration date or go out of the picture or something like that. What this shows is that with technology, I can lower the negotiation cost that are involved in these negotiations. And uh, with um, some mechanisms, some of them might be legal and regulatory, I can rebalance some of that. But your question is very valid, and at the end of the day, it brings us back to the general question of information imbalances. Let me close by saying thank you very much for listening to this. Um, I have always been asked, you know, so are you eating your own dog food? Uh, are you forgetting too? Um, you know, I am a digital cat rack. I have to confess. So I tend to keep a lot of things. So when I moved to the US at the end of 1998, 99, I had three hard disks with me that contained in different boxes, and I, one I carried in my hand luggage and so forth. They contained my entire email archive of 10 years. Because this was the most valuable digital possession I had, I thought. Everything else was uninteresting. I came over to the US. I had it with me. I got my computer. I set it up. And somehow, I destroyed all three copies. <laughs> I cannot tell you how devastated I was. I was close to suicide. Every one of my emails, love letters, professional emails, contacts, gone. 10 years of my life eradicated. I was completely devastated for two days, then life went on.